strategic sets of conversations, but part of that came out of the Washington State Momentum Initiative where right. you, you reward people for the momentum on these kind of success rates. You might want to talk about that for one second, then I want to go to Travis and... Yeah, I do, because uh, one of the issues that I attended, I was back at, uh, with you guys in Ohio, and then I attended on Monday too, and one of the concerns that a lot of people expressed about completion rates is just what you mentioned earlier, the creaming. But this, and that wasn't I, it was some other people in Washington I think were very bright about this. Because they didn't say, look, we're going to look exclusively at completion rates. What we're going to look at is how many of your students complete a remedial math course? We're going to give you points for that. How many complete another remedial course? We'll give you points for that. How many complete 15 hours of a STEM course? We'll give you points for that. And so they're not the, the end result. They are the things that we think lead to a good result. And so therefore, it's, I think it's designed well enough that it leads to greater completion without the creaming. And so I think it's, it's a program that is one that I think is being adopted by other states and it is a good one and will achieve the results that we want. Awards people for taking the hardest to serve, which is great. I want to pick up on your point about innovation and I think where governors come into this. Um, we've got a thousand points of light and I think it's time to start building some constellations. And what I mean by that is we've got to start looking at some of the rules of the game, the fundamental rules of the game in American higher education, public higher education, how we fund institutions, how we handle the transition from secondary to post-secondary, which is poorly, um, and the fact that we need some new models. These 21st century students have different expectations. They come to the higher education process with different expectations. And so when you take what, where governors are, are really wanting to come into this conversation, they're coming in recognizing, and by the way, we're probably going to have close to 30 new governors come November 2nd. Um, they're coming in facing the whole question of what do we do with state government as a whole. So this isn't just a pick on higher education conversation here. This is a massive conversation about how we deliver core public services at the state level, and we need to start looking at what we discover through these programs such as IBEST, look at the measures and say, what's in the way of us doing this at scale? And that's going to lead us right to some things like finance and programming, some of these other things. And that's where state policymakers can come into this and do some downfield blocking is we need to look at our rules and change them where they need to be changed. So, so one of the good. points that, that Mark, you, you made earlier to me is that a lot of what we can do uh, is not going to cost that much. It is not all limited by money. You know, if we improve the success rates of students from quarter to quarter, it is cheaper to, to, to make those improvements than it is to, to try to fund them at some ultimate end of the year or second year level. And we, you know, we, we really need to take a look at the number of students when they come in, we evaluate them and we say that they test, they test low in, in a remedial program. So we put them in, in, in a remedial program. Well, you know, a student can get in a remedial program and some of them will stay in there for two years, and they're still in remedial program. And when are they going to start really getting in school? That's expensive. Yeah. Karen, you, you've done a lot of work on this in terms of measuring the data, right? A couple, right? couple of things that I want to make an observation about. The first thing is the, the policy connection between what the data indicates as being the challenges and then trying to, to use the policy framework to advance the solutions. And you've done some of that in Washington, uh, very specifically with the funding uh, model and also IBEST and, and trying to take that to scale. Uh, second observation on the data. Uh, at the local level, I think all of us have varying capacities for data analysis. All of us make differing investments in our data infrastructure. Some of us have high performing institutional research offices and wraparound services. It's not just the institutional research office, but it's the analytics that are connected through the IT office. And it's the training, and it's the tools, and it's whether your entire college has those tools available to do that kind of on-the-ground ground analytical thinking. Right. And that then has to get to the trustees. So the trustees can ask, the, and I call them, the calls to wonder questions that lead to that rich conversation that helps to pinpoint the solutions that that particular college, or the challenges and then solutions that that particular college needs to take on. And they're going to be different. Uh, so the, so the, the observation that students are staying in developmental education for two years. What's, what's your data? 
around that. Yeah. What right. is that anecdotal, or is that, or is that an evidence-based kind of observation? Right. And that has to be the kind of conversation that the president and the trustees have, and that conversation has to somehow permeate into the college so that the faculty understands that there's an environment that's safe to take risks. Yeah. And, and that's supported to take risks. It's such an important point because all these policy conversations end up coming down into practice, right? Mm -hmm. Faculty have to implement them, staff have to implement them. But the role of the trustee in asking the right questions, framing it, um, and part of what we're talking about a lot at the Gates Foundation is this end-to-end -end perspective, really thinking from first contact to the time they complete and looking at everything from entry to, um, you know, looking from you know, first contact to entry to progression to completion and asking what are the biggest loss points? Where are you hemorrhaging students? And then figuring out what are the biggest momentum strategies? And one of the things that's pretty clear for us that we see is, you know, um, it was said earlier, a developmental education is the Bermuda Triangle of higher ed. Right? It's where we're losing the most students. And so how can you figure out ways to innovate against that so it's not always the course-based model? You can really think about modular, kind of, uh, kind of aggressive ways to do it in, more, in, a more kind of fa in a faster way. And the same things with killer courses, the courses that are wiping out your, your students and the gatekeeper side. And which students? I mean, what we're finding yeah. with, the, with the metrics that we've introduced and the states that are working on them, and we've got about, we will have about half the states at the varying stages right now, and we've got about 10 that are at advanced stages, and one that's done, and as I've looked at what they've done, you can see when you break this out by age how miserably some of our institutions fail students that are 25 years old and older. And I'm not saying that it's necessarily any institution in this room, uh, necessarily, but, you know, as a whole, you, you, when you break out students that are in that traditional or in that younger adult cohort relative to that 25 plus, it's pretty staggering, and especially in developmental. Yeah. When you see that they may pass remedial math or English, but then they go on to take a credit-bearing course, flame out right there. And that's when, they, that's when they're out the door. And that's Tom, when they're out Tom, the door. Tom, that's where faculty, faculty coming to you with ideas like iBest, saying let us work together, right? We'll team up and we'll combine that basic skills training with that vocational training, get into a job faster and get them integrated. That's the, you know, you, you care a lot about engaging faculty in this conversation, I, right? I do. Uh, what, one thing I've got to say to all you trustees out there, let's take iBest. Because I know exactly how that started and it was a trustee. Now, the trustee happened, her name was Phyllis Gutierrez Kinney, but she was a state representative, and so those two things combined. She was, she was very astute politically, too, but I have the pride to say it started in my office. She, she, uh, I think it's a great story because I got a call from her, and she said, I need to talk to you about something. Uh, can I come over? And so I walk out into my office. There's 30 people out there in my waiting room. And that's, for those of you, most of you don't know Phyllis, but that's Phyllis. You know, she will, she will be an agent for change. And she wanted me part because I was a trustee, but also as on the board of a hospital. And she decided that she had a very practical problem that needed a very practical solution. That she is Hispanic, and there were some nursing homes that needed Hispanic speaking, Spanish speaking LPNs. And so she had Jill Wakefield, our now chancellor, who was then at South Seattle Community College, and she said, Jill, can you put some basic education courses? We need that. And Tom, can you get Swedish Hospital to provide the nurses we need to provide the training and the clinical training so we can combine those two things so that we can have employees who speak Spanish out in the nursing homes? And it worked. So that's where it started, but as a trustee. In terms of faculty, you're right. Um, what I've discovered is that it's maybe even unfair to ask the faculty to be leaders. Now ask yourself this, we've just had a description of, of mathematics, for example, remedial math. Year after year, there's one group that understood that we were dramatically failing in what we were doing, and that had to be the faculty that was grading the papers. No change, no leadership change came from them, but there's a lot of organizations that can exercise leadership because they see the big picture. National Center for Academic Transformation, Lumina, some of the Gates Foundations. There's leadership there. The implementers, the acceptors and implementers, need to be the faculty. And the problem is they need to be engaged and brought on board. The good news is that we have done a couple of studies in Washington, a mission study and some others, and we pulled our faculty, and the, by dramatic numbers, they want to be part of it.
You see, a lot of faculty are pushing these conversations, actually pushing administrators faster than they want to go. Your conversation's on wonder, right? Absolutely. I just uh, I wanted to respond to that because I think that in some, many of our institutions, the faculty can be leaders if they have the data in front of them. And we've pushed our data right down to the course level, our student success data. Our program coordinators and our faculty, our program coordinators can get access to it real time right at their desktop with an analytic tool called iStrategy. Now the faculty has access to that. It's caused some angst yeah. and some tension, but it's also uh, created some faculty pioneers that have moved forward with course redesign, acceleration. So it, it's a little chaotic and certainly there's a lot of tension but I do think that one of the things presidents need to do is unleash faculty leadership in some way, find it and unleash it. And the trustees, uh, I think, need to have a little bit of patience with that because some improvements are going to happen quickly right. and others are going to take a little bit longer. And the presidents need the trustees support to bring those pilot interventions to scale. Yeah. So there's going to be balance. Two things. Two things. There are trustees out there that are very innovative and want to get involved and want to move that needle uh, a, a great deal. One of the things that we have to be concerned about is that when these innovative programs come to us, and they come to us from a number of different places. They come from faculty. They come from community. Uh, Sometimes they come from administration. And, uh, and, so, and you have to be careful that you don't cross that border between policy and administration. We have to, you know, you have to be able to work with the president and make sure that here's some good ideas that we think you ought to be implementing, but you don't go out there trying to make it happen. So you got that one. The other piece I think we have to, we have to start to, to use a lot better than we're using it is that our, our uh, technology capabilities. Yeah. We have some strong technology capabilities at the community colleges. And I, I'll just give you an example of our IT department at, at Sinclair. We used it to help us implement our student success program. And without it, it would not have been the success that it has been. And I think we can start to unleash our, our, uh, you know, our, our IT departments in the schools much better than we have, we have done in the past. We think a lot of those kinds of things happen at the four-year. They happen right there at the two-year colleges and some of these. It's about the, the, the infrastructure that we have for teaching and learning is broader than just our buildings. It's now an right. online That's infrastructure. Right. Right. And thinking strategically about how you use all those resources becomes a big deal. I know, I know Governor Manchin kind of chose college completion as his, uh, his imprimatur program, right, well, for this coming year? Well, expected that because he was the governor of West Virginia, he was going to pick <clears throat> energy because, you know, coal state and they'd just been through some issues with coal mines and he said, well, you know, there goes Manchin, he's going to do, he's going to do that. And he sat down and he said, nope. He said, I want to do education. He said, and here's why. He said, I have just had for the last few months, company after company after company coming through my office, wanting to situate in West Virginia. They didn't want the tax breaks. They just, all oh, they had one question for me. Can you deliver me the people that I need? And I had to go to my folks and look them in the eye and say, I, I think so, but he said, I want to be able to answer that question, absolutely yes. He said, and everybody knows where West Virginia sort of sits on this scale. We're usually kind of the bring up the back. And he said, this is why I care about this. And he also had, you know, a father that didn't finish college. And he saw the impact that that had on his life. And he said, you know, we can't afford to keep promising people that they can go to college and not do something on the other side of this. Uh, and he said, I have to be able to look these companies in the eye and say, that we're going to have a workforce that meets your needs. And you know, my job, I have a real job to play here in setting that expectation. I think governors have a key role to play in setting ambitious